Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome. Thank you for joining this Ethos Tracking webinar. If I could have Nita and Danielle join me. Amazing. Well, thank you for those who are here with us. Um, just very quickly, we uh, here at Ethos Giving created a system called Ethos Tracking that helps all people who do good track their data and manage it better. As we've been having conversations with for-profits and non-profits and families, we've come across some really interesting questions and we realized that a webinar would be beneficial to help share some of these learnings um, and also to help share the word that if you're having trouble with your data and you're a non-profit, you are not alone. Um, so this is really a conversation among friends to dig into some themes that we've seen. Um, I'm going to introduce my amazing panelists in a moment. We'll dig into a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, so we're really happy to have you here. If you enjoyed the music while you were in the waiting room, that was um, my incredible sister-in-law, Molly Miller. You can find her <laughs> online and um, maybe we'll do some more tunes on our way out. So uh, very quickly, really, really delighted to have with me um, Nita Kellogg. She is from an incredible organization based in Minnesota called Project Diva that supports young women who are on a path to um, all sorts of growth, emotional, social, financial, uh, and she's an incredible leader who's really helping to foster an amazing community of power women in Minnesota and beyond. Um, and as part of her nonprofit, she's had some interesting data challenges that really relate to direct service work and working with young people um, and helping them get organized. And then I have Danielle Ames Spivak, who is based here in Los Angeles, but represents um, really an international organization. American Friends of the Israeli Philharmonic is dedicated to supporting the Israeli Phil, um, which is based in Tel Aviv, that has a mission of supporting the arts and music as a way to empower the entire society um, and also to help engage people who are in the diaspora have a home vis-a-vis -vis the arts with Israel. Um, and her data challenges are, you know, very different than Nita's, but we'll start to see some themes around, you know, tracking donor engagement um, and really looking at themes and trends in a more macro way. So we're going to, to dig in to two incredible women who represent two very different kinds of organizations um, and are really thinking about cutting edge 21st century questions like many of you are as well. So thank you both. Um, and I thought we would just jump in. So, you know, really the the first question and something that I've talked about with both of you is that data has changed a lot in the last decade. You've both been in the nonprofit world um, much of your careers. You've really seen this shift and how funders have really started to ask questions around ROI, return on investment, um, you know, specific examples versus storytelling. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it to you, Nita, first, and then to you, Danielle, if you could just you know, in a story or two, share with us how you felt this shift in your own organization and in your own work in the last few years. Well, thanks for having me, first and foremost. Um, the shift has, for us over the last, so we'll be 15 years in the summer. And my story, I think is kind of, it's kind of different because we didn't focus on measurements in the beginning. Um, we focused on making sure that our that our practices actually changed lives for the girls that we service. And so we really started paying attention to measurements probably like year five to seven. And it, it's, a, it's challenging when you're not sure how to, um, how to get to the donors what they desire and not jump through hoops while doing it <laughs> and still be able to, especially on a, like with a small team, um, get you know do the work and get the measurements when you know that you are actually changing lives and so I feel like for us the shift um, has been from especially after um, the pandemic piece it has shifted from people want or the donors really wanting to have more of an ROI conversation like what is that return um, and we're still we're figuring that out. And so that's why we're super excited about ethos giving because it really is allowing for us to level set the story and the ROI because we, we have to be able to share how we're changing the girls' lives 
intrinsically versus externally, and then also be able to get the measurements as well. So we're really excited about how Ethos is allowing for us to, to level set on both, both ends without exploiting our girls. Because that's the other thing as a black organization, um, we're looking to just be able to tell the stories of the transformations and not have the, the sad stories to go along, along with it. Um, because that's not a space where we, where we sit in. And so we're really, really excited about how we're gonna be able to do that this year. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. And data helps you do that in a way that's effective, which is Absolutely. so powerful. Amazing. Absolutely. Danielle, same, same question to you. How have you seen this evolve? In your it's interesting. We're doing such different things, Nita, but also for me, and I'm not proud of this, it took until the pandemic to have a much wider definition of data and pay attention to the fact that so much data and also, you know, demonstrating impact of our programming, we were overlooking for so long. And so for a long time, we've obviously been accustomed to uh, reporting to funders, foundations that we've received grants for, even individuals. And we do education programming for over 30,000 kids every year in Israel. And we had a system for documenting, you know, the data of the impact in terms of the amount of students participating, their backgrounds, their locations, the frequency of programming, etc. But there's so much of the work of the Israel Philharmonic, which we expanded during COVID in terms of digital presence and that impact. So that's all new data. But even thinking about the more intangible types of data, like what is the impact of the regular concert goer? You know, we don't necessarily survey every person walking out of a concert or when we travel the world, we say we're a cultural ambassador, but what's the real impact of that? We know it has impact because we feel it when we're there in, uh -huh. in these auditoriums around the world. But how do we really convey that and in terms of data. And I don't have the answer to that actually. And that's a question I have for you now or later, Emily. Uh, the digital feels like a little bit more understandable because it's so trackable. Um, so I'd say we're more traditional when it comes to how we understand our data, when it comes to some of our in-person programming on an education level. But when it comes to all the other, like you said, Nita, the intrinsic benefits that are a little bit more abstract, that's harder to understand how to quantify. Amazing. Well, we were going to say questions to the end, but I'm going to just jump in and answer that because I think it'll help us lead to our next our next question, which is around layering. So, okay, great. We you know we all know we want to track better. Ethos tracking helps you track better, super duper. But if all you have are numbers on a page, like that's not really moving the needle. Um. So you know, just to sort of speak to that, Danielle, the way that we've developed the framework are using a vehicle that we call levers, right? So your organizations have lots of levers that you pull to make the world a better place that may be bringing in cash donations. It may be doing programming. It may be doing educational work. It may be engaging volunteers. Um, and, and that's multifaceted, right? So you could have six different parties or 10 different parties all touch the same goal. The problem sort of the pain point with other data sets that we believe we're solving for with ethos tracking is those are all in silos, right? Like let's say we did keep good data historically, we were able to like track it historically, it was gonna be in a programming line item, in a development line item, in a volunteer line item, and the system wasn't talking to itself. The way that ethos tracking flows, you could run a report and say, what's everything we've done for volunteerism this year? Or you could run it across lever and say, what's everything we've done for engagement of teens for the, for the fill or engagement of families with young children for the fill or for Nita, you know, engagement of financial literacy. And we have the people who taught the classes and what the, what the return, like what those test scores look like. We have the girls experience and sort of their feedback. We have in Nita's case, her amazing young women are starting businesses. Um, that's one of the things they learn how to do. What are we selling coming out of those businesses? Are we getting traction on those, those micro businesses? And how is it flowing out in the community? So it's really that like long, you know, through point, and then also the deep dive that I think we're clicking on something different here. Um, so that's the the answer to your question, Danielle, is both like we go deep and we go wide. Then my question back to you both is just, you know, hearing that and sort of living in your ecosystems, what's a way that you would think about exercising that value, being able to sort of 
pinpoint, oh, wow, I would use that in my organization this way. And I know, Nita, you've thought about this. I'll let you go first. Okay. Danielle. would love to hear from you next. So who's going first? I'm sorry. You, you, ma'am, please. <laughs> I am so excited about that part because um, with the part where you talked about um, how we can, how the different levers are falling for us because for women to get in front of our girls they have to do a personal development um, journey and because we're a personal and professional development organization and so the girls need to see them personally meeting their goals right the emotional goals the um, mental health goals the, the 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 things that we really don't measure and then they also have to see the women doing the professional goals and so to be able to show that our organization is intergenerationally learning together and to bring that to funders so that it's not just the girls learning, but it's all of us in this ecosystem that are expanding, um, expanding both personally and professionally and on per like super personal levels. So it's the whole person and the whole organization. So the levers, we're super geeked about the levers and how we're going to be able to show that the women that are providing the services for the girls are also becoming even more healthier from, from getting the work, doing the work with the girls to then be able to guide the girls. So it's both and for us. And this is the first year that we'll actually be able to show like the, the, the worth of the organization from that perspective. So we're super, super excited. Amazing. And, you know, Danielle, just to sort of like throw an idea out that I was thinking about. And then I want to hear kind of your thoughts for, um, for the Phil, you know, anyone that's attended your youth programming before the pandemic was really, it was really powerful. So Danielle would put together these concerts and, and we'll continue to, as soon as we can kind of gather, um, and you should come to them if you're ever in a city where she's doing it, cause they're so cool. Uh, so, you know, you'd have young families come to concerts, they would experience the music, they would experience the power of the fill. Um, and then, you know, hopefully those people would come on as partners and, and donors. And so there's sort of three questions there, which is like, who attended this event, right? Um, what did they gain from it? Musically, culturally? Um, did they understand our organization better? Do they feel more connected to Israel, you know, as the cultural ambassador piece? And then like that follow along engagement, like, well, how did how did they become part of our ecosystem? Are they participating in online events now? Are they coming to, you know, future events? Are they coming to galas? Are they telling their friends about us? Um, and sort of the KPIs around your user engagement, I think is a place where data collection is really healthy and helpful and also hard to track otherwise. And we'd just love to kind of hear you speak to like how you corral your, your info and, and how you would think about using this as a tool here. Wow, Emily, there's so much here. I almost feel like I'm in a therapy session and I know it sounds like a joke, but it's so interesting. And I wonder, Nita, and I think we might be different like this because you're more programmatically focused than me mission-wise in terms of my engagement in the United States, particularly because we're all friends of organization. And I feel I'm really judged at the end of the year based on our bottom line. Thankfully, we usually get to the goal of fundraising where we need to be. But there's all these other sets of impact that, in some ways we get credit for, but at the end of the day, we all know that the dollars and cents ends up sounding or feeling like the most paramount or at least what your board values the most. So what's really interesting is the pre-ethos philanthropy landscape was very much like the CRMs that we used that tracks you know, the gifts that came in and maybe someone would manually enter a note that they tried to get a gift, but it didn't come through or that somebody did come to an event even if they didn't make a donation. But generally everything we did, it could have been, for instance, a hundred hours spent on X if it didn't end up translating into a dollar, even though there was short or long-term impact in another way, you know, it kind of just went into the, I was gonna make a pun, unintended, into the ethos. Um, so, it just even with us, we started a partnership, and I know Emily knows about this with Aspiration, a financial institution to make the Israel Philharmonic carbon neutral, uh, the first orchestra in the world, I believe, to be carbon neutral by the end of this year. And again, that's not something that necessarily we financially track, but I think is, is huge from a brand perspective and also just, you know, world sustainability perspective. So when I realized that through this technology you've created, we can look at those things. It was a lot of validation I needed as a professional 
because sometimes it feels like a lot of your time feels wasted, even though you know there's impact. It's like if the tree in the forest, if no one knows the tree in the forest, you know, fell or whatever, did it fall? Like we need to start paying attention to all these trees. So, and in the Jewish community, and I wonder, Nita, if this is true in your, you know, communities that you work in. I think there were decades in philanthropy, and Emily's going to laugh maybe, where like every conversation was that. How do we reach people? Where are those people? How do we engage them? And now we have this opposite problem where we actually have more data than we know what to do with or have the technology to process. And we kind of know where people are now. We know how to reach them because it's on their cell phone and on their email or whatever. And and kind of accepting that actually the pro, kind of our worst nightmare or our best nightmare came true, which is now we actually know exactly where everyone is and how to get to them, but it doesn't mean we're using it to actually further our mission in an effective enough way. So I don't know if that answered your question, but those are the thoughts that come to my mind. And I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us on the nonprofit side, because I think Nita, you'll agree with me. I hope you will. Like, we don't ever have time to talk about or think about these things. We're just trying to like survive. And there's something really refreshing about even having a forum to be able to address some of these um, macro issues. So thank you. Well, I, and this goes to all of our, our audience members, we love talking about data and how to have data help you help the world better faster. So anyone that wants to deep dive and have, um, you know, these sessions we're, we're in. So, you know, Danielle, you just shared something about the change in the relationships. Like, how do we find these people? One of the things that I've observed, and I'd be curious to hear how you both have experienced this, um, relationships, of course, matter. Interpersonal, like this person knows I care about them. I follow up with them. They see me. I see them. That's that's great. You know, my day job is working as a, you know, a philanthropic advisor and helping corporations and philanthropists um, you know, give resources, whether that be money, in-kind, products, time, et cetera. And we've seen a real shift around, you know, relationships matter, but relationships aren't going to get you over the line. Like if I love this person and I don't really understand how the work is moving the needle, I'm as the advisor, not going to be able to make a recommendation that we should continue support because the world needs so much help. The day is short, resources are limited. Like we got to put our dollars where we know we can create impact based on our goals. Um, I'm wondering if you've felt that shift from, you know, yes, relationships matter, but they're not the like end all be all that they were. Is that, is that reading for you both? I'll, Nita, I don't, I don't want to interrupt if you want to go first. I, I think I'm going to say something potentially offensive, but I see it as an age line. And I don't know if I, I think my younger donors care a lot more, a lot of, and I don't even know if I'm being politically incorrect and I apologize if I am by saying that, but I, I think that there was this feel good takeaway of some of our long-term, you know, decades long supporters who we value immensely. They care about the orchestra. They they care about the musicians. They've known them personally. They know me. They know our other staff. They know our board. They are a board member. That's a lot more driven by the relationships. And in some ways, that's actually really rational because if you firsthand feel connected and close to multiple people in an institution, you can feel you have firsthand data about the impact, right? If you're firsthand experiencing the positive impact, you feel that that's evidence enough. So I think there's some overlap in the relationships with the data, so to speak, if you're that hands-on. But I think definitely a lot of younger or newer funders, maybe it's not about age, it's just how long the person has been affiliated with the organization, have a more scientific way of looking at it. And they could be fond of us or individuals involved, but that's not compelling enough, like you said, to make a major gift. Thank you. Nita, I don't know if there's a pickup on that. Yeah, that was good, girl. <laughs> I think it's both and. I think that it's the relationships of, like you were saying, um, Danielle, the, the older the older group that have been donating all, this, all these years, and then the younger group, group that's coming in. You know, for, for me as a founder, um, 
and coming from, you know, a small town or a small city in Omaha, Nebraska, I didn't have access to a lot of the donors that I would want as major donors. So I've had to build some of those relationships. But like you were saying, a lot of them have those that they're already, you know, engaged in. And so I've had to play off of relationships with just regular everyday people who give a shit. You know what I'm saying? Like they really, they care about about the thing about the whole person it's like we're moving into this era of well-being and so I feel like I'm the relationships that I'm looking to build at this point are really those who care about the next generation that is moving into that space and not so much those who are looking for a return or looking for you know the the old way donors used to to ask for ask for um, information about where their money was going yeah. And I'll just say, you know, for both of your organizations, you are the both and um, you have the relationships and you have the, the work to back it up. And I think that's why you're both so powerful and running such powerful organizations. Um, so if people have questions, we're going to do about five more minutes of, of Q&A between us. But if folks in the audience have questions, you're definitely welcome to start punching them in and we'll start getting to that. So before we do one kind of double click. And I think we've already spoken about this a little bit, but I really want the audience and everyone, everyone at home listening to, to really understand um, this term of KPIs. Okay. So, you know, key performance data, we all kind of throw that around. Like, what does that actually mean? One of the things that we've identified in ethos tracking is you do something for lots of reasons, not just for one reason. And we want in the system for you to be able to, to grow or shrink those deliverables as you need. So in our records, you can put no KPIs, you can put one, you can put 50. Um, and you know, just to throw out an example, you know, we do a lot of funding in the, the food access, kind of food justice space. You may be giving a donation to support meals, to support um, healthy food access education, to support, you know lobbying engagement, you know, advocacy organ engagement with local city officials to support cooking classes. So one gift can, can do a lot um, or, or one activation can do a lot. I'm wondering, you know, just as people are thinking about it um, who, are, who are listening in the audience, like, okay, I'm not just tracking attendance. I'm not just tracking how many people came to this. I'm tracking the why, I'm tracking the experience. If you could just throw out an example of something that you've done that you're like, we really feel like we got the data set on this one, or, or just an example of how you would think about data, you know, beyond the, the number of humans in chairs or the humans on the Zoom and how you've kind of worked through those questions for your organizations. Cause I think that's a pain point for a lot of folks that, that we talk to at least. Well, I know for us, we've had to move, well, we've moved to really zoning in on um, surveys where the, the, the young, the girls that we service are actually sharing their experiences. Um, so the survey that is not like a one through 10, as much as it is, tell us how you felt with this. What do you, where do you feel you're going, you know, next? Like all those, the more, the things that they can see themselves actually um, realizing in real time, getting them to document that, um, in writing and then videos. So we do a lot of videos, which I love about ethos is each girl can talk through her, um, her moments in time over this, the next year. And we're able to put them under her individual record, but then pull from all the girls records over the course of the year. So as we're sharing with donors, they're actually able to hear it or see it personally from the girls themselves. And so, the, you know, it's really, um, it, it's beyond I'm, I'm beyond overjoyed to be able to have that component because a lot of times with the other tracking, it doesn't give me the options to do both and. It's either one or nothing. <laughs> and so to be able to track, track those ways is where we're, that's where we're really, really excited. Amazing. And I, you know, I know that everyone's looking for quantitative. It was really important for me that we had that qualitative data. Like we want to hear the stories. We want to hear the, we want the photos. We want the people. So I, I appreciate you calling that out. And we think that's a really value add part of the system is that you get, you got your numbers, but you also have your, you know, your soul. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, such a good question, Emily. I, for us, what's been interesting is to see how much nostalgia plays into the enthusiasm of responses we get, mm -hmm. whether it be in terms of feedback, donations, opting in to receive content, watching content we've already released. 
I hadn't imagined, I think, and if I wouldn't have seen the data to back it up, that even in this kind of modern area we live in and everyone's very worried about the moment and thinking about the future, that nostalgia still plays such a intrinsic role with philanthropy. And that kind of is data which has helped us. And so we have then gone and kind of doubled down more on certain elements of programming that really tie to legacy and history and important cultural events from the past and things that are important to our community and our target demographic in terms of memorializing them. Even, even for instance, we did a program that um, honored the, the anniversary of the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the response. And then we realized, well, people really want an opportunity to honor the memory of people they respect and admire that are now, I mean, we wouldn't have even considered it before. It was so an outpoint compared to, you know, we can release an amazing concert, but there was something that pulled at people's heartstrings about that program, which has propelled us to change the direction of the messaging or how we reach people going forward. So I think that it's those kind of tidbits in the data, which are not quantity necessarily, but of kind of what, what resonates like a, a heart, heart string with people. For sure. So now I want to flip the script um, and you both are welcome to ask me questions. You know, like, let's pretend this is office hours. You're thinking about data. You have a problem, you know, would love to just kind of play out um, any, you know, any questions that you're wrestling with. And then we'll do the same you know, with our audience. So if you all have Q&A, you can definitely start to put that in the chat where we're open um, or we'll, we'll keep riffing on some more questions, the three of us, no problem. Well, I had a question for you, Emily. Um, I, knew you, I knew you before Ethos. And so when you think about why you created it, what is your why? Oh, so, you know, we are, I, I built Ethos because I believe that we could help people do good work better, faster. And um, I'm an eternal optimist. I believe that we can, you know, help support and solve some of the world's greatest challenges, but we have to have expertise and data and information and be making decisions from a business perspective that are smart. Um, and I felt like there was a gap and having lived this work in house, in a, in a place that really took on social challenges in a really ambitious and multifaceted way. I felt like I had a playbook that I could lean into and I, I wanted to share it with the world. Um, I'm only one human and I have a, a real vision um, for an outsized role that I can play in making the world a better place. And I felt like by creating a framework and sharing it, I could pack a bigger punch than I could as an individual. Well, I appreciate you for <laughs> Emily, I have been thinking a lot about the following and it's po I'm posing it to you as a question since you, you know, giving us the forum to ask. We've had a lot of turnover in my, well, it's a small organization we're in. So a lot, meaning one or two people feels like a lot. And we really struggle with the idea that when something is so relational in terms of other people and institutional memory, what happens when there's turnover? It's really hard on development institutions, especially, I think it's hard on any institution to go through transition, but when so much is about the relationships and people carrying those relationships in their hearts and their minds, and it doesn't even necessarily live somewhere in terms of your you know, hardware, software, um, you know, how, how do you feel this software really can help with that conundrum I feel we're in right now? Yeah, thank you for that question. So I, and again, like going back to like the therapy session, you are not alone. Um, the, the amount of conversations that we've had, and, and I'll tell you with some of the biggest companies that have CSR departments, nonprofit organizations, foundations, and even families where you would think institutional knowledge makes, you know, works because they're all a unit. Memory fades data gets lost, um, and we see it time and time again with attrition, all of the teams that we work with are too small. Um, they're very nimble. They're very entrepreneurial. That's awesome. No one has any extra fat in the, in the good work world. Like I've never seen an organization that has too many humans and too much memory. Um, 
And so inevitably what happens is you have one or two people who hold everything, maybe it's three or four, but it's not 20. Um, and they are, you know, chiefly responsible. And then when they, you know, leave or graduate to a new position or whatever it is, you lose a tremendous amount of the, of the knowledge and the stickiness. And we really built this system again, kind of going back to that, the question that Nita asked, like I, I built this because I felt like I could help solve a problem. One of the biggest problems that we have is Danielle, what you just described, which is like, we want this work to outlive all of us. It needs to, we're doing it because it matters and we have to have data. And I, when I'm talking with people on the corporate side, I often say like, you know, okay, you're a manufacturer. Imagine if you spent, you know, one day a month thinking about your supply chain and then asked somebody for an annual report that got shelved in some, you know, cardboard somewhere that never got looked at, like, could your company survive or be successful? And the answer is, of course, no. Um, you know, we have really detailed tracking and we have, we don't rely on institutional knowledge. We have systems to manage this because this is a core part of our business. This social good work is a core part of your business. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that I think we we really appreciate is hard, but this should be just as easy to track as it is for, you know, Driscoll's to track their supply chain management for their strawberries. Um, and so that's really what we wanted to create the system to do. And we don't boil it down to a skew number. This work is about the relational piece and it is about the fabric, um, which is why we've breathed in so much of like the video content and sort of that like, you know, that soul piece. Um, because we know it's more than the numbers, but you need the numbers to have the soul, I think. Did that answer your question? Great. Any other questions? And then we have, we have some coming in from the audience we can flip to. Okay. Um, so one question, which is a great one, does ethos work with APIs? Um, so, you know, APIs are the... I don't actually know what the acronym stands for, if anyone else does chime in, but it's the thing that allows your technology to talk to another technology. Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. The last thing we want for all of these busy people who don't have enough hours in the day is to waste time putting information into two places. So if you have a primary location that you log your volunteer data or that you log your fundraising data, great. We're actually working with Nita. She has an awesome crowdfunding software that she loves using that creates a ton of data. That's where her dollars flow in. That's where she gets some of her donor information. Rad. We worked with that software team and our software team to create an API so that we bridge the data so that she doesn't need to spend any extra time thinking about that piece. We put it into ethos tracking where we have everything else, as she talked about the details related to the young women, how their businesses are going, her volunteer management, et cetera. Um, and it all talks to itself. So if you like working with, you know, name your platform, we're here to help you not reinvent the wheel and, and take what's what you need and, and not do any work on the user experience side. So that's an awesome question. Um, we have another, oh, wait, they're both about APIs. <laughs> okay, cool. Lots of people wanted to know about APIs. So yes, exclamation mark. We don't want you spending more time. Um, the other thing that the system allows you to do, if you don't have a software tool that for whatever reason can speak to our software tool, or if you're tracking everything in Excel, no problem. We have, um, you know, we have Excel too. So we have CSV files that we take your data, translate it to our data, and we can do big backend data dumps so that you don't have to manually enter information. Um, the third thing that we provide on the system, much like SurveyMonkey, we have a survey functionality. So if you are working with a partner, um, whether that partner is internal to your organization, like, hey, volunteer lead manager, give me this data, or hey, external third party, give me this data, we can send them a survey from your ethos tracking system to say, hey, you promised to do these three things. I'm going to ask you about them once a quarter or once a week or once a month. How's it going? And all of the information, you know, comes into that record in real time. So, you know, Nita can send those surveys to her young women to say, you know, you promised to do three uh, pitches um, this week or next, next month or whatever, how's it going? They can say, yes, I did my three. Here's a video of me doing one. Here's a feedback from someone in the audience that they loved it. You know, whatever your KPIs are that you're asking, that's how the surveys track. 
Love the API questions. Any anything else from our panelists? So I'll I'll throw out one. Um, the you know the number of people who are trying to tell stories has just increased so much because of the internet, right? So like we're all publishers now. Um, so you know one thing that we really appreciated was that like we can build a system that helps you track your data in a container, that's awesome. But we also wanted to be able to share a really easy functionality for you to be able to pull any data at any time. So if your board member calls or a, you know, someone from your fan base, you know, your community calls or a donor calls to say, hey, you know, what's everything that you've done in Chicago this year? And you're like, well, we do volunteerism, we do these Zooms, we do um, in-person activation, we do, you know, whatever. You're able to pull a report that says what's everything we've done in Chicago across all of our levers and be able to have a report on that data set. Um, alternatively, if somebody calls you to say, hey, what's everything you've done with teenagers? <laughs> um, you, if you've been capturing the data accordingly, which if that was important to your org, you would, you can pull a report to say, here's everything we've done in teen with teenagers. So by issue area, by geography, by constituency, we can help you track your data across the levers so that you can be able to pull information very quickly. I'm looking at our Q&A box. And if you have any, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for, for sharing that with the world, because I don't think, well, I just want people to understand like how thorough you have thought this through, right? Like when I think when 15 years in and really trying to, to create data that makes sense for us, when we sat down with you, we all, my whole team left the call super excited, like not just me as the the, the, the executive, but like to see the team excited about the possibilities of how we're going to really be able to um, track everything so that we know what our growth is. And then to be able to tell the girls, like show the girls what their growth is and for them to be able to see their, you know, see the growth and then donors as well. Like you really, like it's so thorough. So we, I just want, I'm glad that you explained that part of it because the people need to understand how you've really thought this through. Thank you, I appreciate it. Well, I will, you know, I'll share a final wor word before I do that. Um, Nita, Danielle, anything else you wanna add to the conversation? Well, I do quickly, which is just, I I'm very interested in the visualization of the data. Is that something that you make recommendations about in terms of how to then present or interpret or does the product itself kind of help with that? Yeah, so we created a UX that we think is pretty clean, right? We we briefed this into our developer. We wanted it to feel like an Apple experience, not uh, you know another kind of IBM experience. And so basically, all of the data gets gets packaged really cleanly. So you can tag it and say, "Hey, I want to be able to have this be part of a specific story I'm telling around this kind of program or this kind of advocacy or this kind of you know whatever." Um, and the container exists for you to put all of your records in. We also have something that we call campaigns that allows you to say, hey, I'm doing lots of work in this area. I'm going on a volunteer blitz and I'm getting a ton of cash in the door and we're doing sub micro grants. We're actually regranting some of these dollars. And I wanna be able to visualize that. We set you up so that you can make part pie charts and bar charts. So simple, clean graphs. Um, you can choose your X axes, you can choose your Y axes and what data you want to sh what you want to have on there um, so that you can kind of be ready in the system to have a simple story and a simple you know reference point we hired our first um, full-time team member for ethos tracking she's amazing her name is eliana michelson and she is our customer success manager so we think we created a really slick system that's easy to use but we also know that we're building a new language um, and so we have someone who's whole job is being dedicated to our client's ability to use the system. So of course there's technical support, but there's also user support so that you can really maximize the value. And I see Nita nodding because she's been able to really dig into the weeds with Eliana and she's seen the value um, to really help set the system up so that it's like your perfect engine. Yes, to speak to Eliana, when I say everyone that she is extremely thorough too, and she walks you through what you don't understand about the technology side as well as like how the system works she's 
amazing. It's really cool to be able to have her. Um, her customer relations is, is beyond words. So yes, we love Eliana. As my kids say, heart, she's a heart. Um, no, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, look, like I come from the donor side, right? So I'm looking at this through the lens of how are the people who are part of the, you know, the funding ecosystem thinking about this work? How are we helping you, the nonprofits, tee up this data so that you're speaking to your donor audience in a way that's giving them what they're looking for, how they're looking for it, um, and really impressing them and saying, wow, like this person's a best in class partner, like I'm going to double down with them. Um, and we're not hiding the ball, right? Like the same system that we're using for our corporate clients is the system that we're using for our nonprofit clients. Like we really believe this is the language of the future, um, really helping people think about the whole pie of how we work with each other and really shifting the model from being like, I'm the donor and I'm the grantee to like, we're all in this together. Like the whole reason we are showing up is that we believe there's important work to do. You have your shovel, I have my shovel and how are we effectively doing it together? And you're doing the part that you're best at and I'm doing the part that I'm best at. And like really creating a language for that so that everyone feels really clear on what success looks like. Um, we got a question and we're, we're at time, but I'll answer it, which is how does this help nonprofits improve the impact that they make? I think we've you know sort of answered that through some of the, the conversations that we've just been having. Um, but just to say it explicitly, you can't manage what isn't measured. So ultimately, if, if your data isn't in one place, it's really hard to know effectively and strategically where to spend your time, where to double down, where to make changes operationally if things aren't working. And so like, Step one is making sure that everything that you're up to, you're able to look at through one home. And that's number one, what we're providing. Separately, once you have your data and you're starting to look at month over month, year over year information, you can say like, wow, like we were really excited about this program. We really thought it was gonna move the needle based on our mission. And as it turns out, like look at program C, like it's really like, well, you, it's changing the way kids are thinking about you know, food for, you know, a food justice organization. It's changing the way that we're able to get out our message. Let's think about regrouping and putting some more love behind C and D because that's where we're really seeing some, um, some extra fruit. And, you know, there's, there's just so much to do once you're able to kind of see this bird's eye view. The other thing that I think we do from an impact perspective is just to open the aperture. Um, I think a lot of organizations are sort of in their lane and they're doing their thing and they've done it for a long time and that's awesome. They may have not thought about how they can branch out and think about you know, engaging in, in employee engagement. Like, hey, like part of your social impact work is bringing your own team into the impact language um, or thinking about sustainability or thinking about DEI or thinking about some of these things that are pressing matters for our world and how you're a part of that. And it's really motivational to say like, wow, like we're doing all this stuff. And I hadn't really been like, you know, not to be crass about it, but like taking credit for it. Um, and so just being able to show how impactful your organization is based on your core mission, but also on all of the other things that you're doing to be a good neighbor and to just be a good organization in the world can really help you set a powerful, um, you know, strategy for your, your impact work today and going forward. Um, so I know we're at time. I wanted to say thank you. Um, if you get nothing else from this conversation. If you're struggling with your data, you are not alone. Um, we are all kind of living in a, a real moment of growth, I think, across every sector. Um, everyone's thinking about this from fresh new perspectives. We're always happy to have these conversations. If you or your organization want to have them in a, a big Zoom model, we're in. If you want to have them one-on-one, -on -one, we're in. If you're interested in Ethos Tracking, we're at www.ethostracking.com. You can schedule a demo. Um, and as we start saying a lot around here, we really believe, you know, hashtag better data, better world. And we appreciate all that you're doing to already make our world better. And if we can can help you lift um, some of that pressure by helping you manage the data, we would love to be a part of your ecosystem. So thank you. Thanks for sticking with us five minutes late. Thank you um, to Nita, the amazing work that you're doing with Project Diva. Danielle, the incredible and beautiful work that you and the Israel Phil are bringing to our ecosystem. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll put some music on to, to bring us out. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>